our own lives. Um, so this being the first Sunday of the month, um, as we have been doing throughout the uh, year of 2021 so far, we were uh, taking lessons uh, from the book of Nehemiah. So if you have your Bibles and you want to open up to the book of Nehemiah, we're going to be talking about Nehemiah chapter 6 down through chapter 7, verse 73. Now we're not going to cover every single verse. Uh, we could read it. We'd be here for a little while, but um, a great chunk of the end of chapter 7, actually from about a third of the way through chapter 7 all the way down to verse 72, uh, is a list of the families uh, that returned to uh, Jerusalem and to Israel after the exile in Babylon. So that's a great, um, a great list to look at to see how many people had returned. Um, and it was, uh, it was what we would call the size of a small modern city today. So uh, close to 50,000 people. Uh, and back uh, a few thousand years ago, uh, 50,000 people was actually a really big chunk of folks. Uh, so it's not, uh, it's not a bad thing to see um, all of the names of all of the families uh, that returned. We're just not going to cover them uh, today. So uh, we'll be uh, talking about chapter 6, starting around in verse 15. Now, uh, of course, uh, running on the theme that we have uh, been looking at for uh, the year so far, I'm, I'm uh, consolidating some of the things that we're talking about here. But so far, we see Nehemiah has addressed or addresses the destruction of the city of Jerusalem, the walls and the gates of the city of Jerusalem, by recognizing that there was a problem, orienting himself toward God, determining to take action uh, to resolve it, relying on God's strength to see them through, uh, developing a plan to make things better, uh, recognizing that there is opposition, getting a true understanding of the problem, rallying like-minded people to the cause, refocusing, continually refocusing on spiritual things, working together at all times uh, by updating his plans as circumstances change, dedicating Israel to protect one another, removing the political from the spiritual, supporting the oppressed and those in need, and from last uh, time preventing bad influences from derailing the plan or the plans for Jerusalem. So Nehemiah has been a busy guy. He's, he's really taken to the work. He's really taken the work seriously. He's really digging deep into his own uh, spiritual reserves, if you will. He's relying heavily on God uh, to make sure that he stays on the right track. He's doing everything he can to pull the people of Israel back together uh, so that the city of Jerusalem can be restored, uh, so that Israel is not brought to shame. And by Israel not being brought to shame, God is not brought to shame either. And so all of these things are happening. They're all going on. Um, there's a lot happening with, uh, with the opposition that's facing, um, that's facing Nehemiah. We know that there are some people inside of Israel that are opposing him. We know that there are some outside forces, uh, in particular a guy named Sambalot and Tobiah and a few other folks um, who are opposing him. And today what we're going to do is we're going to see what happens at the completion of of the wall because as you can see from the title the wall actually does get finished nehemiah shows up and he gets to work he rallies all of these people around him he continually updates and and moves things around so that he can make sure everything happens as it should and the wall is finally completed um and this this was a major major undertaking um if you're not familiar with how a city like jerusalem would be set up um, there would be a kind of a center of the, the city where the population started. And they would actually build a, a low stone wall to start off with in the development of the city. They would build a low stone wall to kind of keep, uh, keep some things out and keep, uh, keep some things in. But as the city grew and became more important, especially if it became a military target, they would actually start building thicker and thicker and higher and higher walls. And if you go to uh, like the book of Joshua, for instance, and you read about what was happening when the children of Israel were going after the city of Jericho, th these walls were so thick and so big that people would actually build their houses right up against the wall and their houses would become part of the wall. And so you would have walls that would be dozens of feet thick from uh, outside to inside edge and people would actually live inside of these walls. Uh, and so these were not small undertakings. This was not something that was easy to do. And also remember, there were very few 
um, uh, very few mechanical advantages that people had back at this day and time. They had, of course, you know, the levers and ropes and a few pulleys and things along those lines. But this was mainly done by hand. And by hand, I mean hammer and chisel in hand, pick up the blocks, roll the blocks, lift the blocks, place the box, all done by hand. And so this was no small task. And you take into account also that the opponents of Israel were very close by and they were under constant threat of attack. And so half the time, the workers that were standing around were holding the spears while the other half of the workers were actually doing the work. And so the work time that we see uh, in this is just absolutely incredible given all of the, the things that they had against them. So in chapter 6, verse 15, we read, So the wall was finished. On the 25th day of the month of Elul, in, the, in 52 days. Man, that is absolutely incredible. Now, they weren't starting from nothing. They still had a few parts of the wall that were standing. But the repair work that they had to do and the fact that they had to rebuild and reset the gates, uh, as well as doing all of this while under the constant threat of attack, is absolutely astonishing. It is absolutely astonishing that they were able to do this in such a short period of time. Verse 16 goes on and says, And when all our enemies heard of it, all the nations around us were afraid and fell greatly in their own esteem. For they perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. So there are a few things that we see in these first couple of verses of the section we're covering. The first thing that we see is that the work was finished on the 25th day of Elul. That's approximately August 27th, 444 B.C. So um, I don't know that there's any other significance to that date other than the date that the wall was finished. But I thought it was interesting to know the, the time of year. So it would have been in Palestine or in, the, in, the is, in that uh, Middle Eastern area in the middle of summer they would have been doing this. And of course, you know, we can't make it from the car back into the building and the air conditioning before we nearly pass out right now. Imagine rebuilding a wall, a stone wall by hand at this point in time. I, I have heard though, however, in the Middle East it's a dry heat, so I think that makes it better, right? <laughs> so, so we see here that the work was finished in 52 days, and as I pointed out, that is an absolute amazing accomplishment. These folks got the job done. And of course, we also see that their enemies became afraid, afraid and discouraged. They fell in their own esteem. They, they, they weren't quite so arrogant. They weren't quite so haughty when they saw the Israelites go and finish this wall. And of course, you remember the, the guys like Tobiah and Sambalot were, were mocking the Israelites and they were saying, oh, this wall is so great. Y'all are doing such a great job. You know, if a fox jumps on it, the whole thing's going to fall. And, so on and so forth. And so they were really bold. They were really proud or when the Israelites first got started on the wall. But after a while, I could imagine, they were seeing brick by brick this wall coming in. And, and they see they're getting ready for an attack, but the guys are standing guard. And, and as they went through this and they saw all of the work being done and all of the people rallying around, they kind of got a little less bold and a little less bold and a little less bold. And now the wall is finished and they are afraid because they perceived, and quote from the text, the work had been accomplished with the help of our God. How in the world did these people get this work done this quickly and this well? How in the world did they make this wall come back together? How in the world did they get these gates set? How in the world did they thwart all of our attacks? How in the world did they make sure that they weren't intimidated by us threatening to tell the king that they were going to rebel. Why? Because God was on their side. And when it becomes so obvious that the people that do not believe in the God of, he of the heavens, when they start recognizing he is involved in the process, the enemies of God start melting away. And so we see this incredible feat is met by an incredible defeat of the enemies of God. We continue on. Uh, we also see that Tobiah, I've mentioned him, and we, he's mentioned as, a, uh, as an opposition to Nehemiah all throughout the book. Uh, Tobiah continues to play politics 
in Israel. Now, if you remember a few lessons ago in this series, one of the big things that we talked about was the fact that we must, under every circumstance, remove politics from religion. Well, of course, Tobiah is involved in playing politics in Israel. Now, there's some things that are going on here that I find very interesting, and I, and I honestly uh, hadn't really dug into before until I started uh, studying for this lesson. In verse 17, we read, Moreover, in those days, the nobles of Judah uh, sent many letters uh, to Tobiah, and Tobiah's letters came to them. For many in Judah were bound by oath to him, because he was in the son, the, he was the son of law, a son-in-law of Shechaniah, the son of Arham. And the son of Jehoahan had taken the daughter of Meshulam, the son of uh, Bechariah, as his wife. Also they spoke of his good deeds in my presence and reported my words to him. And Tobiah sent letters to make me afraid. And so what do we see here? We see a lot of politics going on. We see a lot of games being played between Tobiah and the nobles of Israel uh, trying to discourage Nehemiah. And the language of this particular chapter seems to denote that this was an ongoing problem. This was not something that happened once or twice. This was not something that happened after the law was completed or, or something along those lines. This, this seems to indicate that this problem was ongoing from the time Nehemiah got there until well after the wall was finished. And so, to, and so Tobiah was continuing to try to be an influence of opposition against Nehemiah throughout the entire process. <clears throat> we also see that some of the nobles had taken oaths with Tobiah. Now, this is an interesting problem that the Jews had gotten themselves into, it would seem. Nehemiah's been there for 52 days, okay? He showed up, he told them the work was going to start, they got the work started, they got the work finished, but the people of Israel, especially some of the nobles in Jerusalem, had made kind of covenants with or, or treaties with Tobiah. Now remember, Tobiah was a, a tremendous influence in the people, uh, with the people opposing Israel, and so if you make your enemy your friend, uh, then you might not get hurt. Uh, you might get eaten last, so to speak. And so the people of Israel had made these treaties with Tobiah to preserve their own personal wealth, their own personal standing, and now it's coming back to cause them all kinds of problems. We also see that even some of their families had intermarried with his family. And so you see, uh, he's got a son-in-law, and he's, he's the son-in-law, and he's, he's given his uh, son to marry this daughter, and so on and so forth. And, and we see all of this interconnection. So now, Tobiah is not just integrated in the politics of Israel, he's integrated in with some of the families in Israel as well. And of course, in ancient Near Eastern culture, how do you seal a tree? And actually, this carried all the way until uh, the 18th and early 19th century in European politics. How do you seal a treaty? I'm going to give you my daughter to marry, or, or you give me your son to marry my daughter. Something along those lines. And so that would kind of seal a treaty. And so we see this happening quite a bit here in Israel. And so these connections were strong. These connections were, uh, were uh, very important to these people. And of course, the nobles in Israel spoke very highly of Tobiah to Nehemiah as well. Hey, Nehemiah, I know this guy's giving you some problems, but he's not all that bad. And look, he's done some good things. He's helped this person, or he's done this, or he's supported that work, or, or whatever the case might be. Nehemiah doesn't go into any great detail on the good deeds that Tobiah had actually done. So it kind of leaves the question mark, had Tobiah really done anything good, or were the people just saying that he was a good guy? It seems unlikely that he had done nothing positive in Jerusalem or in Israel during that day and time because of this close connection with these families. But the nobles are trying to speak very highly of him to Nehemiah. But Tobiah continued to try to intimidate Nehemiah. Remember one of the things that we talked about. Not only were they making fun of the Jews for trying to rebuild the wall, not only had the opponents of Israel tried to plan a, an ambush to try to attack Jerusalem before the walls were finished, but Tobiah and his group and with, with Sanballat in tow had threatened to write a letter to the king, the king that had given Nehemiah leave to come to Israel to fix the walls and the gates of Jerusalem. And he was going to tell the king 
that Nehemiah was going to set himself up as the ruler of Jerusalem and they were going to rebel. And of course, that leads to one of my favorite lines out of the book of Nehemiah, when Nehemiah tells them, you are making these things up out of your own mind. Uh, and so we see this didn't stop here. So Nehemiah uh, is still constantly being berated and barraged with all of this attempt at intimidation from guys like Tobiah and Sanballat. We also see some other things that are happening here. Uh, but the question may remain, and here's something that I thought was interesting, and again, something I didn't know, didn't realize until I was uh, dug into a longer and deeper study of this particular passage. A question was raised about whether Tobiah was a proselyte to Israel, to, to uh, Judaism. Now, this was an interesting process by which someone who is a Gentile, and it's also possible that Tobiah uh, had some, some uh, Jewish ancestors uh, because a lot of the population was shifted around uh, <clears throat> When, when the Assyrians and Syrians came in before Babylon came in and took them out. And so a lot of the population was displaced. They were moved around. And so the Samaritans, the people that lived just to the north of, of Judah, were, were of mixed religious ancestry. Okay, some were, uh, uh, some were pagan and some were Jewish and they intermarried. And so you ended up with kind of, uh, and this is a terrible, terrible slur, but this was a terrible slur that the Jews also used against the Samaritans, but they would call them half-breeds. Uh, they would call them dogs or Gentiles or something along those lines. And, and so they had some connection to Israel, and when things were going good, the Samaritans were Israel's friends, but when things were going bad for Israel, the Samaritans would take advantage of them and attack and, and ridicule them. And that's another reason why the parable of the Good Samaritan is so important uh, in the New Testament is because of that, uh, that racist history, and we'll just call it what it is, uh, and that because of that racist history between them. But there was still a process by which uh, someone who was outside of Israel could convert to Judaism. And so the question is, was Tobiah a proselyte? We see a lot of influence. We see a lot of intermarrying. So it, that's a question that may be um, uh, that's definitely worth asking. If he genuinely was, however, this wouldn't have been a problem for Nehemiah. So if he's really a convert, if he really converted to, to uh, Judaism, if he had really converted to follow the Most High God, why would he be fighting so hard against him? So it seems even if it was a, a political shift, if, if it was a social shift to say, okay, I'm going to uh, identify with the Jews so I can kind of intermarry and get involved here, uh, that, that would have become a tremendous problem for Nehemiah because Tobiah would not have been sincere. Now, I don't know for sure, of course, we don't have information from the Bible, but knowing people the way I know people, it would not surprise me for him to have said he was converting, but, kept, but did that for his own personal, political, and social, and financial gain. So, it seems like the fruit of his labor shows that his uh, involvement in the inner circles of Jerusalem had become very dangerous for Nehemiah. And now we see that some of the nobles from Jerusalem were spying on Nehemiah and reporting back to Tobiah. And others were taking Tobiah's words and trying to, trying to scare, trying to intimidate Nehemiah. And Tobiah, of course, was writing these letters and sending these letters to, to all the people of Jerusalem and sending them to Nehemiah, trying to scare the man. And with all of this stacked against him, and we talked about the opposition uh, last, or we talked about this terrible opposition last month, with all of this stacked against him, it would not have been a surprise had someone with less character, less strength, and less faith than Nehemiah to fold and to run away. But Nehemiah's reliance on God sees him through. I recall in the New Testament, there was an apostle by the name of Paul. And he went to a city named Corinth. And in Corinth, there had been a few riots, uh, some small-scale riots compared to what happened in Ephesus. And, and, and people were being taken, they were being uh, drugged before the magistrate, they were being beaten, and, and Paul was afraid. And Paul was about ready to run. And God came to Paul in a dream and he said, Paul, do not be afraid. Stay here in the city and continue to preach the word because I have many people here. And we see another guy named Joshua after his 
mentor and friend, Moses, died. And he was getting ready to, to lead Israel across the Jordan and, and to go take on that city of Jericho we mentioned earlier. And, and God had to come to him and said, you know, told him, don't be discouraged and do not be afraid. We see God encouraging his people no matter what circumstances they face, to continue moving and pressing forward. And we see this in Nehemiah, and we see this in the completion of the work in Israel. And so we see the rebuilding of Jerusalem continues. Not only did we see the wall rebuilt, but we see other parts of the city the life of the city being restored and being rebuilt. Verses 1 and 2 we read, Now when the wall had been built and I had set up the doors and the gatekeepers, the singers, and the Levites had been appointed, I gave my brother Hanani and Hananiah, the governor of the castle, charge over Jerusalem. For he was, more faithful and God, he was a more faithful and God-fearing man than many. And so we see here that the gates are set in worship can begin again. One of the things that enemies of a state would do when they came in and they defeated the state is they would, they would destroy the houses of worship. They would uh, bring in their own gods. There was even one of the Assyrians uh, that came in and conquered Jerusalem. He went in and he set up an altar to Zeus in the temple and sacrificed a pig on top of the, of the altar. Now this was a tremendous, tremendous insult and a sure sign of their defeat for the Israelites. But here we are. Uh, this is actually Nehemiah rebuilt, uh, rebuilt before that happened. That happened uh, a little bit later on before the, uh, uh, during the intertestamental period. But we see the worship being reset and restarted here in Jerusalem at this period of time. And this is a big deal because this means that not only do we have the social life and the economic life and, and the military, the, the protection of the city coming back up, but we also see the religious life of the city coming back. And of course, Nehemiah turns over control of the city gates. He gives that to men who are faithful. He gives that to men who, who are trusting in God and who are going to be faithful to the charge to protect their city and not get themselves involved in the politics and in the influence of men like Tobiah. We also see in verses 3 and 4, and he says, I said to them, let not the gates of Jerusalem be open until the sun is hot. And while they are still standing guard, let them shut and bar the doors. And so here we have these gates. We need to use them properly. Make sure that we can see what's going on outside. The sun's up. It's bright out. We can see what's going on outside. And make sure that when you close the gates, uh, it's done before the sun is down and everything is barred while the guards are still standing still. We just rebuilt the city. We don't want the enemies getting in. That's something else to keep in mind here. Once we have gotten our, our walls of fortification back up, just because you have the walls doesn't mean you can leave the gate standing wide open. And so we see that here with Nehemiah. And verse three, uh, verses 3 and 4, he says, Appoint guards from among the inhabitants of Jerusalem, some uh, at their guard posts and some in front of their own homes. The city was wide and large, but the people within were few and no houses have been rebuilt. So we see here the importance of making sure the people are safe. We just got everything rebuilt. We want to make sure we continue to protect it. So he directs the gates that the gates were to be controlled and the guard was to be set because the people had not yet returned to the city from exile. Think about this. Back in January, when we talked about chapter 1, and we talked about Nehemiah hearing of the destruction of the walls of Jerusalem, how the walls had been torn down and the gates had been burned with fire, his heart broke. And he pleaded with God. And he pleaded with the king, and he was given leave to go back to the city. And he went back to the city not just to rebuild the city. But remember, Nehemiah was in exile. And lots of his brothers and sisters were in exile too. And Nehemiah wanted to make certain one thing was there. He wanted them to have a home to go back to. He wanted them to have a place to call home. When we think about the damage that has been done, and that's kind of where we started in January, the damage that's been done to, to the society and to the church and to, to our own lives personally over the last year, year and a half. 
and we think about rebuilding, and we think about bringing things back together, it's because we want to get back to where we were. We want to come back home. We want to have a, have a place for a, to, to, for a base. We want to be able to get back to the work. Nehemiah didn't just go back to rebuild a city just to rebuild a city. We don't rebuild a church just so we can all come and pile up in here one day a week. We're still going to pile up in here one day a week or two days a week for sure. But it's so we have a place to come back to, so we have a place called home. So we can go out and still continue to be about the work of glorifying our God. And we know this year has been rough too. There's a lot of rough stuff going on around us right now. But once we have the walls back up and the gates set, and we have that place to call home, it is time for us to get about the business of glorifying God. So what happens here as the exiles begin to return to Jerusalem? In verses 5 through the first part of verse 7, we read, then my God put it into my heart to assemble the nobles and the officials and the people to be enrolled by genealogy. Genealogy, gene, genealogies were tremendously important to the Israelites, especially to the tribe of Levi. And I found the book of the genealogy of those who came up at the first, and I found written in it. These were the people of the province who came out of captivity of those, of those exiles whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, carry, uh, had carried into exile. They returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each to his own town, or each to his town. They came with Zerubbabel, Jeshua, Nehemiah, Azariah, Ram Ramiah, Nehemiah, Mordecai, Bilshan, Mispareth, uh, Big Bigvi, Behu, and Neham, and Bahan. Banha. That's a mouthful right there, isn't it? Hey, go read Second Kings. Let's see what we can get there. It's amazing. We see these exiles returning. And he lists the leaders that brought back the exiles from Babylon. And, and folks like Nehemiah and Zerubbabel and, and some of the other uh, priests and, and things along those lines were tremendously important in being great leaders for these people to come home. And, and it shows that we need people to step up and to, and to carry the banner so that we can be brought back together and continue to move forward in the work of the Lord. And the ones that came back with them were numbered in, in the last part of verse 7 all the way through verse 65. I told you we were going to cover all the way to verse 73, right? We just, we just covered 58 verses at one time. And so there were some 47,000 of them. But we also see that many of them gave to the continuing work, not only to the work of the wall, but to the work of the temple, to the work of worship. And that was the important thing. Uh, Nehemiah came back to Jerusalem to build it so that people could have a home to come to, but so that they would also have a place for worship. The city of God that he set in place for him to be with his people. All of this to the glory of God. Now we know that they fall short a little bit, and we know that a few books later, uh, some of the uh, some of the be rebuilding has to continue. But this was the start. This is what got them going. In verse seventy-three, the last verse of the chapter says, "So the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, some of the people, the temple servants, and all Israel lived in their towns. And when the seventh month had come, the people of Israel were in their towns." The exiles had begun to return. Now I remember, hard to imagine, it's been over a year and change, a year and four months since we went into quarantine and lockdown and everything else along those lines. And I remember the first couple of Sundays when we had services back. You remember how, how many people were here? 15, 20, the first couple of Sundays. And we did a live broadcast on Facebook for the folks that were home. And, and there were several Sundays over those first couple of months where we had more people watching online than we had here in, in person. And look at us today. We're coming back together. We're still missing a few. We have a few that are traveling. We have a few that are sick. We have a few that are taking care of sick family members. We still have a few that are joining us online, but there is no substitute for coming back home. There is no substitute 
for returning back to the place where we can worship God together and where we can plan and move forward from this building out into the world around us to glorify the name of our God and to continue to rebuild. We see the people of Israel return home. It's a lesson for all of us. And I dare say, I'm going to go out on a limb here. I'm going to go out on a limb. I would dare say, having your city overrun by an invading army and being carried away into captivity by Babylon is probably a little more difficult than what we faced. Maybe a little bit. And I'm here to say, not only did we see them carried away into captivity, and we see men like Daniel who, who have to fight so hard against this, and we see guys like Mordecai and Esther, uh, ladies like Esther, who have to fight against uh, their, their problems in captivity. And we see, we see people like Isaiah preaching against all of the idolatry and all of the problems that were setting the people of Israel and Judah back. And we see men like Nehemiah, however, uh, take on the, the fight of getting people back to where they need to be and to getting them back to the work and getting them to back to glorifying God. And this is what the purpose of rebuilding is. The purpose of rebuilding is to get back to glorifying God. A couple of lessons I think we can learn from this passage, from this chapter and a half. One, I think we need to understand if we stick with God's plan, we can complete the work He has set before us. Go to Galatians chapter 6. Read that chapter. See the difficulties that are set in front of us. See the challenges that we have to face. But know that at the end of that chapter, Paul tells us that we will see, that we will see the harvest come if we don't give up. If we set our minds to the work, if we set our hands to the work, and we stay true to God's plan, the work will be completed. And we can be involved in the glorification of God. Because God's glory should be seen in the completion of His work, not our own. Nehemiah was not doing what he was doing for his own personal glory. In fact, he suffered quite a bit. He suffered a lot of loss. He left his place by the king's side as the cupbearer, a very trusted position, very comfortable position to be sure. And he traveled across, uh, across the, the western steppes of Asia all the way over to, to Jerusalem to take on this work where he was underappreciated, under threat, and intimidated every single day. But he did that to glorify God. Our work should glorify God. It's not about how good we are. It's not about how many people we have. It's not about anything but what our God has done through us and for us. We also see that with our work in Christ, others can be restored. One thing I pointed out last week in our lesson from Galatians chapter 6 is there are people that should be sitting where some of these seats are empty. Now, a few, a few of those folks are traveling, I understand. A few of those folks are taking care of sick loved ones, I understand. But there are other folks that just aren't here. And we need to do what we can to restore them, to bring them back, to let them know that they have a home right here with us. And together, we can all undertake the work that God has set in front of us, and we can all glorify the Lord. But to do that, they have to be here with us. And it is our job as those who are spiritual in the spirit of humility to go and to restore those from their sins. We also see finally here, we shouldn't wait on circumstances to be perfect in order to be about the work. But preacher, you don't know. Things have been so bad the last year and a half, two years. Oh, I know. But preacher, you don't understand I've had this problem and this problem and this problem. I know. I've been right there with you. And I'm not saying that to chastise. Well, okay, I'm kind of chastising. I'm not saying that to shame anybody. Let me rephrase. 
But I'm here to tell you, we're in this together. And I know where you're at. And I know what you've been through. I've been there right with you. I've had the loss. I've been sick. I've, I've done this. I've done that. I'm not, I'm not trying to, to hold myself up higher than anybody else. But I'm here to tell you, I understand. And God knows too. He knows better than I do. He knows better than you do what you've been through. But I also know that God calls us to the work. Because part of rebuilding is rebuilding to glorify God. Let's not wait on everything to be perfect. The walls of Jerusalem were built. The people could come back home. We're only halfway through the book. We know there's more to do. And Nehemiah undertakes those efforts. But here we are. Brothers and sisters, it's time to get back to it. It's time for us to be about the business of glorifying God. So how do we rebuild? Consolidated and recapped, what do we do? First, we recognize that there is a problem. We know that. We've understood that. We orient ourselves toward God. We point our hearts and our minds toward the Lord. We refocus on spiritual things. Sometimes we get beset with worldly things and it takes our mind off of Christ. Just like when Peter was walking on the water, when he stopped looking at Christ and he started looking at the waves, bloop, down he went. But we have to refocus on those spiritual things. And we need to develop a plan to uh, take on these problems with biblical wisdom. Biblical wisdom is the idea of we march around Jericho 13 times, blow some horns, and the walls fall down. It may not make sense to the world around us, but we understand the will and the, wor and the word of God so that we know the plans that we need to take. We know the steps that we need to take. We also need to rely on God's strength to see us through. If it were not for God, Nehemiah would not have made his first trip around the city. If it weren't for God, Nehemiah wouldn't have gotten leave from the king to go back to Jerusalem. We also need to recognize opposition, who or whatever it is. Even if that opposition is my own heart pulling me away from God. We need to also watch out for the tricks and traps of our, of our opposition, especially if it's your own heart. There's nothing that will lead you astray faster. We need to work together as much as possible, shoulder to shoulder, side by side. If that means one of us holds the spear while the other one works on the wall, we do it. But we get about the work. We need to bring the church, our faith, and our prayer life together to overcome. We have all of these tools at our disposal. Let's use them. We also need to remember those who are in need and help when and where we can. There are things that we can do. We may not even be aware of how important or how powerful those things are. I always remember the lady at church I preached that up in Missouri. She told me one day, she said, Brian, all I can do is send out cards. I said, Miss Martha, you have no idea what those cards mean to people. Something that simple can mean that much. We need to be about helping those who are in need. We need to stay on the path that God has laid out before us. Don't depart to the right or to the left. Don't get sidetracked by the things of this world. Don't get sidetracked by the great things of this world. And don't get sidetracked by the bad things of this world. Stay on that path. If we get knocked down, great. Somebody will come along help you stand back up. But stay on that path. Don't just roll over to the side of the road and... Sit in a ditch and wait for the world to pass you by. Get back up and get back after it because we have to follow that path until the job is done. What is that job? Our job is Christ's job to seek and to save that which is lost. Our job was Christ's job to glorify our Father which is in heaven. Our job was Christ's job to do what we can to bring others to the knowledge of God. But there is one task, there is one job that Christ finished that we could never do, and that's by becoming the sacrifice, my favorite word, the propitiation for our sins on that cross at Calvary. Because with the shedding of His blood, our ability to accomplish the work is opened up. Our opportunity to follow Him all the way to the gates of heaven is wide open. Don't fall back. Don't shrink back. And just like from the book of Hebrews, the Hebrew writer tells us, don't be like those in the rebellion 
who had an unfaithful and unbelieving heart that prevented them from, from crossing into God's rest. So if you're here today and you are not yet a child of God, know that you have an opportunity to be baptized today, to have your sins washed away, so you can be added to the church based on your hearing of the Word of God, your belief in Christ Jesus, and your desire and your willingness to repent of your sin and to confess Christ's name before men. If you are here today and you are a child of God, but you find that you've allowed sin to separate you from your Heavenly Father, and you need to be restored back to your place in His kingdom, know that you can do that today as well. So if you're here and you have any spiritual need, won't you come meet me up front as together we stand and sing our invitation song.